uh, during the course of this day we've considered many things, some of which, uh, well, we find distressing other things, Lord. We thank you for your grace and mercy to us as a people, but we thank you, Lord, too, for your word, and we pray, Lord, that you will be pleased to use it tonight. Speak to our hearts and minds, we pray, that we might be the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. So to John, and uh, of course there's only one chapter, so let me read from verse 1. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be in us forever. Grace, mercy and peace will be with us. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as you have received commandment to do from the Father. I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which you we have uh, had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you might receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching is both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face, so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. It's thought to be greetings from another church to this particular church. But the phrase I found myself thinking of was uh, just that it says there, uh, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth. He says the same thing in the second or in the third letter as well, that is pleased that some of the children are walking in the truth. And this matter about walking in the truth I think is very precious in many ways. And I'm so grateful for intercessors for Britain, and particularly Dennis Clark, and for his ministry. Not only that he put that emphasis on intercession, and perhaps helped some of us to have a real vision to pray for our nation, but the importance that he set upon the truth, and the zeal for that truth. And I'm very grateful to his ministry for the way in which he taught the Word of God. I don't think I ever sat under Dennis's ministry and went away feeling hungry, always feeling well fed. And I don't think you can say that of many preachers, Uh, but thank God for that. And I just found myself thinking about this phrase then, walking in truth. And, you know, in some ways, it's not quite as perhaps we would take first off, because there's so much, so many ramifications, so much interaction with other things. As uh, John speaks in, well, the first letter particularly. And as I was trying to think of how John would perhaps express it, I found myself thinking of four areas, and yet they're all interrelated, so it's not very easy sometimes to separate them out. The first thing that if we're walking in truth, we have a living relationship with God our Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. Of course, we know that's all where it begins. And uh, Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, uh, said, This is eternal life, that they might know you uh, and to know the one you have sent, basically, was what he was saying. And that's the beginning. But it's the continuing as well. Because if we're really going to walk in truth, we've got to walk in that living relationship with him. 
quite interesting the way John begins this letter. Actually, there's such a likeness between his gospel and the letter. Many ideas come through into his letter as well. But he says what, we, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was of the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Or some manuscripts say so that your joy may be complete. And that's where he starts in this whole matter. That word of life in this particular version, the New American Standard Version, they have capitalized that because they're saying really the word of life, that message, that gospel is the word that came and dwelt amongst us. And that life that was manifest we've shared with you so that you might have fellowship with us. But it goes on to say more particularly that you might have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And that's what it's all about. To really have fellowship with Him. And what a marvelous thing, really, to be able to come before God our Father and to know that Jesus is our Savior. Of course, He goes on to point out that if we say we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's a matter of fellowship with God in the first place. Yes, John says, we've preached this gospel to you that you might have something in common with us. The word koinonia comes from a a word that basically means what we have in common. And uh, when we talk about fellowship, we, we talk about what we have in common. What we have in common is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes our fellowship real. But the real matter is that you have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And what a privilege that is. Of course, he stresses the need to uh, walk in the light. And that, that fellowship can so easily be uh, broken. And I would suggest to you that there's a great connection between walking in the light and walking in truth. And if we have those things in our lives that we haven't confessed, that fellowship with God is broken, but sometimes (laughs) the fellowship with one another is hindered. We can't perhaps get quite so close to one another because there's something just coming in between. And how important it is to come to the light, to bring it out to the light, to share it with our Father, to admit our sin so that uh, we can be cleansed from that. And we know that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God there's nothing that He cannot forgive. You know, some churches are not prepared to talk about abortion because they think there may be somebody in the congregation, uh, a lady who's perhaps had an abortion and they might uh, feel guilty. Well, we need to be able to talk about those things so that they come to the light and find that forgiveness and know that it is completely cleansed and there's a real healing. In fact, the word for cleansing here, we get our word catharsis from. And I believe there's a real healing process that takes place for women who have gone through such things. It is important we bring them to the light so that we may truly know that we have peace with God and to know that His love and His grace has forgiven us. And perhaps some of those struggles that we were thinking about this morning that people have gone through important that they can come and bring it to the light and bring it to the Father who does truly cleanse. But of course John goes on to talk about abiding in him. Comes out several times. He says for instance in John chapter 2, or 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, The one who says he abides in him 
ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. If we're truly continuing with Christ, if that relationship is good, then we're seeking to walk in a way that Jesus walked. We're seeking to live in a way that he lived. Now that's quite demanding, it's not easy to do, but the grace of God is there for us. But it's that whole matter of abiding in him. Of course, this is a matter that John had taken up in his gospel, hadn't he, when he talked about the vine and the necessity to abide in the vine if we were to bring forth much fruit. But also he pointed out that if we don't abide in the vine, then the branches die and they're cast into the fire. I don't know that we've taken that seriously enough. I don't think Jesus was just putting out a picture there. There's something of reality that is frightening. So it's not just beginning with that relationship with the Father and with the Son. As vital as that is, that first experience to know Jesus, to know that our Heavenly Father has indeed set us free because of what Jesus did upon that cross. But it is a matter of abiding in Him. And it's clearly said that we cannot produce any fruit without abiding in him. So if we're going to walk in the way that Jesus walked, we need to remain in very close contact with him. We need to be at home with him, as it were. And I think those times when we do sin, something of that closeness, that nearness has been broken. In fact, almost we step out in our stubbornness For instance, if we find ourselves uh, speaking bitterly against somebody, (laughs) we're not really abiding in Christ, are we, when that happens? So that whole matter of producing fruit is that that relationship with Jesus is absolutely vital, that we go on abiding in him. You may remember that Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then you may ask what you will and it shall be given you. That almost sounds like a carte blanche to get uh, whatever you want from God. But it's not. Because you see, if we're really abiding in Jesus, we begin to know the mind of Jesus. And therefore we can begin to pray according to the will of God. Now, I'm not going to pretend that's easy. Uh, Sometimes we have to spread the thing before the Lord and uh, certainly get through some of our fleshly uh, uh, reactions to some things. But if we abide in Him and His Word abides in us, so that we begin to know the nature of God and how God begins to work, then we're far more likely to pray right down the will of God. So this relationship is absolutely vital if we're going to walk in truth. There are those who sometimes say that, well, we're in agreement, Lord, and uh, more or less you have to do uh, what uh, uh, we want you to do. Uh, based a bit on Matthew 18, uh, where it says, if uh, two of you agree, well, let me quote that accurately. I find I don't remember scripture as well as I once did. So so as to get it right, again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. And you hear sometimes people say, Lord, we're in agreement. And expecting God to act. But the very next verse goes on to say, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. It's not just you two coming into agreement, there's a third person there. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's right in the midst. And I don't think we would ignore Jesus when we're praying. But again, that important relationship with him, so that even as we come to prayer, we might really know the mind of the Lord. That's why it's troubled me in these days that I see people looking so much on the internet for information about things. But I wonder if they're as keen to come alongside of the Lord Jesus Christ and to make sure they're abiding there. Do you spend more time on the internet or more time in the presence of the Lord? 
No, I don't suppose we find it that easy to spend large quantities of time in the presence of the Lord, but there is that matter of continuing in Him so that right throughout the day we can be bringing situations to Him and right through the day we can be meditating on the Word so that it really gets into our hearts and minds so that the Word shapes you. Trouble is, we want to shape the Word to what we want rather than the Word shaping us to what God wants us to be. So there's a matter about abiding, that continuing relationship, that fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And what is more, I find myself thinking of uh, 1 John 3, 1. I always marvel at this. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. And such we are. It's a reality. The moment you had that new birth and you cried out, Abba, Father, was the beginning of it all. But I think we need to immerse ourselves again and again in the love of God. You know, I think all of us would be much more secure if we really meditated on the Word of God, or on the love of God. I think the Apostle Paul did. He loved me and gave himself for me. I don't think he could ever get over it. He who was a persecutor of the church. God set his love upon this man. So that he became a preacher of the gospel. Rather than a persecutor of the Christians. He loved me. My brothers and sisters. God is our father. And we are his children. It's not just in word. It's in reality. Again, this relationship is absolutely vital because if we immerse ourselves in the love of God and if we love Him as He loved us and we, we love Him because He first loved us. He did the drawing. We responded because we see His grace and mercy. But if we really abide in that love of God, we won't want to do anything to hurt Him. We will want to keep His commandments. So this whole thing about walking, whether it's in the light or in in truth it's all about a relationship with one of course who is the truth the Lord Jesus himself the second thing about walking in the truth is living righteously living righteously quite interesting John poses certain problems or he says this is how you may know that you're born again or you know him and in uh, there in chapter 2 and verse 9 he says the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause of stumbling in him but the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and, do not, and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes very strong words the one who says that he's in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness I found myself thinking about one person who is very zealous for the truth but he attacks those that don't quite see things his way with such venom and such bile but I find myself thinking about this. To walk in the truth is to walk in, in love for our brothers and sisters. And Paul is very clear too when he says in Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter if I remember rightly, that we, if we have to rebuke a brother, we don't rebuke him as an enemy, but as a brother. Now of course there is a place sometimes to put a person outside of the church. Either because they have brought heresy or uh, because they have sinned and not repented of it. But that is always to be done in love and for their restoration basically. And not hatred. And you and I must measure up to the mark that is here. Do I really love my brothers and sisters? 
And this isn't particularly an emotional thing. Paul says in Romans that uh, the one who loves does no harm. Those are not exact words, but that's what he's saying. And of course the law is summed up. Loving God and loving one another. Actually, for us as believers, we're to love as Christ loved. And that's a sacrificial love. I wonder how many of you can quote to me 1 John 3.16. You all know John 3.16, but what is 1 John 3.16? Well, let me put you out of your misery. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The sacrificial love. I've known once or twice when I've been in bed and the phone has rang and uh, it's meant I had to get up at uh, some unearthly hour to, well, once I had the joy of leading somebody to Christ about midnight because uh, this person wanted to know how to come into the kingdom. That was no problem, but uh, sometimes to be disturbed out of our, our leisure is not quite so, um, quite so good. And yet there has to be a measure of sacrificial love for one another. You know, the days may well come that we have to protect one another because of persecution in this country. I wonder if we had to draw up a list of Christians that we knew whether we would actually draw up that list or not to save our own skin. (coughs) Quite a challenge, isn't it? But perhaps that's taking it, well, I won't say too far, but the challenge that is, is there. But you see, this is the matter, if we're walking in the light, if we're walking in truth, if we're really born again, we will love our brothers and sisters. And it may be sometimes very demanding. But then again it goes on to say that uh, we can know whether we come to know him or not, whether we keep his commandments. In verse 4 of chapter 2 here of 1 John. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Now I'm not going to pretend it's always easy and we always immediately obey the commandments of God. But basically things have changed for us since we've come to faith in Christ we now want to keep his commandments and I don't think we always stress that enough to new believers alright we may sometimes say that we're not under law but we're under grace but I think that's been misquoted Uh, because what the apostle Paul was saying there that when he read the law he gave uh, 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 credence to the law he gave consent with his mind But he found he wasn't able to do those things that somehow the law didn't help. In fact, he said it even showed him what sin was like and he found himself coveting when he read, you shall not covet. It actually says in Romans 3, and I've got ahead of myself a little bit here, but in Romans 3 it says that uh, by by faith the law is confirmed. Let me uh, quote exactly. Uh, because I think sometimes we've misconstrued what it means to say that we're not under law, we're under, under grace. Romans uh, 3 and uh, the, right at the end there. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. What Paul was really saying was the law couldn't help me to overcome sin. There was another law at work in my body. The law of sin and death. But grace not only forgave me, grace helped me to change so that I was able to obey his commandments. Something happened within me. The grace of God, the love of God, that kindness shown to me means that I want to live in a different way to please him so it's keeping his commandments, keeping his word yes uh, it's also a matter of overcoming sin you may remember some uh, difficult words are said here, well let me uh, first go to uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 29 if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of God 
one who is born of God practices righteousness. He goes on to say that everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and lawless as uh, sin is lawlessness. Sin is disobedience to the law of God, the commandment of God, basically. But he points out that no one abides in him sins, and no one who sins has seen him or knows him. The problem with that is that it seems like it's almost sinless uh, perfection, but it's not. What it's really saying is that a person who comes to faith in Christ does not go on practicing sin, is how it is put here in one uh, one point. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. And the one who practices sin is of the devil. A serial adulterer has not been born of God. He can be born of God. His whole life can be changed. A serial liar, a serial murderer. What has happened is when we come to faith in Christ, something of the power of sin is broken. But make no mistake, you have not become sinless. Those words earlier on in uh, 1 John, and they were read uh, earlier today. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And I need to go back to the verse before. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. We've still got something of that old nature, unfortunately. But actually the person who read that went on into chapter 2 who says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It's amazing how easily we make excuses for our own sin. We can be so quick to condemn other people. But thank God we have an advocate with the Father. But here is John saying that you can overcome sin by the power of God. That doesn't mean we become sinless in this life, I don't believe, for one moment. Paul says that he pressed toward the mark of that high calling. He doesn't consider himself yet arriving. But he presses toward that mark and you and I should be pressing on. That's walking in truth. Walking in righteousness. I don't know about you, I... I certainly haven't come to that place where I can say I have overcome completely sin. But I trust I'm a better Christian today than when I began that walk with the Lord 70 years ago. I trust I'm a better husband today than I was in the first year we got married. And I think Val will tell you I'm a better husband. That doesn't mean I've arrived. It means I'm pressing on toward the mark. But I don't go on dwelling in that old sinful nature. Something has to change. Faith without works is dead. But again, it's not our own effort, is it? It's by the grace of God. It's His power. And where once our bodies and those uh, instruments of uh, sin, as uh, Paul talks about in Romans uh, 6, uh, he says, no, our bodies have come, become instruments of righteousness so that we've almost come, become slaves to righteousness you know there was the old debate there uh, Paul was answering shall we go on sinning that grace may abound and Paul said no you died to sin sin shall not have dominion over you again let me stress because I don't want to bring anyone under condemnation we all know that we still sin but thank God, God can wipe the slate clean every day. You know, I think one of the lovely things is that every time I come to communion, to think I can take those elements and to know that I can stand before God in that moment absolutely clean. Not because of what I am, but because He's wiped the slate clean. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all unrighteousness. There's no condemnation for those in Christ. And yet the devil will come back again and again, won't he? He's the accuser of the brethren. And how do we overcome him? By the blood of the Lamb and that uh, word of testimony. By the blood of the Lamb in the sense that we confessed our sin. And his blood has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. 
Yes, walking in the truth, overcoming sin. I've already spoken about that living relationship and abiding in Christ, but it's a matter of abiding in the truth if we're going to abide in Him too. In 1 John, let me go back to the letter, 1 John chapter 2 and um, verse 24 says, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. You see, what we have here is the, the gospel, we have the word of God. This is the this is what was from the beginning. And we need to contend earnestly for the faith, and where we start to depart from this truth. We're no longer abiding in Him. Because He's the truth. He's the way we have to go. And once we move away from the Word of God, once we move away from the truth of God, we're somehow separating us from the Father and from the Son. So if we really want to abide in Him, we have to abide in the truth. That's why it's so important that you and I read it. That we meditate on it. That we allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and minds. To see where we're failing. And then to say, Lord, I need your grace. You know, isn't it a marvelous thing that it says that by the... Well, let me refer to 1 Peter. I found these thrilling words uh, over the years. 1 Peter chapter uh, 3. No, it's not 1 Peter chapter um, 1 and verse 3. Sorry, it's not. It's 2 Peter. Chapter 1 and verse 3. He says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Partakers of the divine nature on two bases. One, the Holy Spirit is working in you. And secondly, you have the word of God. And those promises of God. So that we can be overcomers. Again, let me stress that this is a battle. The old nature is there. We know from time to time. We react wrongly. We think wrongly. But thank God... We have his word and his promises that he is able to keep us. We have his word and promises that the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Freedom to change. Freedom to be changed into his likeness. This is walking in the truth. But to do so, we need to make sure we're abiding in his word. And not moving away at all from that. I would ask verse 27 because it's all linked up with the work of the Holy Spirit. As for you, the anointing, uh, sorry, you, I didn't give you the chapter, did I? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. And there's that importance of abiding in the word of God, but abiding in the anointing. What is really being said here is that when you became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I trust you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that you went on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And because he is the spirit of truth, he will lead you into all truth if you're really open and wanting to know. You know, people come to the word of God sometimes and just give it a slight twist to mean something that, or they make it mean something that scripture isn't actually saying. And actually we who handle the word of God are told to handle it accurately. Uh, There were talks about rightly dividing the word of truth. And the word is to plough a furrow, a straight furrow. The trouble is that sometimes we just want to twist it a bit. To fit in with how I see things. With my weakness. But the Holy Spirit 
wants to bring us right back into the right place so that we abide in his word and we abide in him. That's why we need to be filled daily. Where it says be filled with the Spirit is the present continuous. Incidentally, where it's talked about pre- uh, practicing sin, it's the con- uh, present continuous tense. Goes on sinning. That's the point. It's not one of. The one who goes on doing the same thing is not born of God. Because there's that divine seed in us that will help us to go the right way if we're really abiding in Him. But also we have that anointing of the Holy Spirit that can keep us right there according to the Word of God. My friends, it is so important that we abide in the truth because there's a battle that is going on. And John alludes to it here. He says in 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Probably need to give a bit of explanation there. By this time in the church, Gnosticism had begun to rear its ugly head. Gnosticism is a word that we use from Gnosis, which means uh, knowledge. And a lot of store was being put on human knowledge, on philosophy basically. And what the Gnostics were saying was that matter is evil. And therefore, basically, they were saying God could not have created this world because matter is evil. Well, in the beginning it says God made all things and it was good. Matter is not evil. It's how we use things and misuse things that is uh, the problem. But they also went further. They said Jesus could not have taken a human form because the body matter is evil and they said therefore some phantom came upon uh, the person Jesus and departed before his crucifixion so the whole thing became unreal and we know full well that John saw that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and we beheld his glory the only begotten uh, the glory of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth Jesus took a human form Your form and mine was made in our likeness so that he could represent us before God, that he could be our high priest, that he could be our sacrifice for sin. If you deny that Jesus came in the flesh, you deny the reality of the incarnation and all that goes with it. God with us in a human form. That's the wonder of Christmas, isn't it? God should actually take our likeness and what is more he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin giving us encouragement and helping us to know that we can come to him he knows the temptations he knows the the weaknesses that we have and he's able to come to our aid because he conquered he overcame sin and never gave in to it even when Satan tried his worst to bring Jesus to a point of sin so this was part of the battle that was going on he speaks in chapter 2 about uh, many uh, antichrist he says you know antichrist will come but he says many antichrists have come and the one who denies the father and the son uh, it, that spirit of antichrist is there particularly that's in Islam of course but he says these people have gone out into the world they were never really part of us in the first place I think there are some who are false teachers who never really were of the Lord and they end up some of them a long way away from the Lord too but you know all of us can be led astray if we're not careful and we need to test the spirits to see whether they're of God Peter makes it very clear that false teachers will come. John, uh, Jude made it very clear too that there would be false teachers that would undermine grace and turn grace into licentiousness. The devil has always tried to undermine the work of God. There's a battle. But if we abide in that anointing, in that uh, fullness of the Spirit, continue in that and abide in the Word of God, then God enables us to walk in the truth. The 
The third thing that I see coming out in this particular passage is the whole matter about overcoming the world. In 1 John chapter 5 he says, in verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It goes on to say a little later that the whole world is in the, uh, the authorised version said in the lap of, uh, of the evil one of Satan, uh, in the power of Satan. Satan is controlling the world and therefore we have to be very careful about all that is coming from the world, the thoughts of the world and so on. That's why we must very much abide in the word of God. Why we must have our minds transformed and not be conformed to the world. The trouble is the church is allowing itself to be conformed to the world. It may not realize it but what it's doing it's not abiding in Christ any longer. It's separating itself from Christ and from the Father. We're no good to anybody when that happens. No good at redeeming the world. Actually in our prayer time this morning we were talking about uh, um, pride and arrogance. John says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. We're not saved by doing the will of God, but we're saved to do the will of God. It's not of works. But in the end, having received uh, that faith that, uh, uh, so that we're saved by faith through the grace of God, then we become his workmanship. And it's his life being worked out in us. Go back to that vine, it's the sap, the life of Jesus flowing through the branches, or through the vine to the branches. His life in us. John says there in the second chapter again of this letter, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And that's again repeated uh, a little later, that you have overcome the evil one. Part of maturing is that we begin to overcome some of those temptations of the devil that comes to us again and again. But this is a victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. It's not that it's that faith alone, it's that faith in Jesus that enables us to overcome. It's that grace that is there, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that is there. So that we can know victory through him. John also says, greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Let's not underestimate the power of Satan. He's a very powerful person. But there's one who's far greater. And again, if we're abiding in him, we will walk in the light and we will walk in the truth. That relationship is absolutely vital. Remember that Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We can see his victory. We can see that he never once succumbed to the worldly pressures, to Satan or anything that was in the world. Not to the thinking of man, but to the thinking of God all the time. You know, I still wrestle with how much God is trying to say something to the church and to the world through this pandemic. But I have a feeling that God is actually training us up as his people. Teaching us to endure. 
Ashley was saying last night he believes that we will go through the tribulation. I personally believe that as well. Actually, I have to be quite brutal in some ways in saying that uh, uh, a rapture before the tribulation is not in Scripture. It wasn't taught before. Well, uh, some see it in Scripture. I need to be careful. But it wasn't taught before 1830. And it was Irvin in Scotland, J.M. Darby in uh, Ireland, and Schofield in America that uh, promoted that so much. I see very clearly that it's after the tribulation, after these things, that Jesus will come. And I just wonder whether the Lord is not training us up at this present time to really learn to endure. I found myself thinking of those words, and I think I mentioned it in the, um, in the Watchman, those words in the Hebrews, where very much it's talking from chapter 10 through to chapter 12 about enduring and um, how Jesus endured. But then in chapter 12, and I think it was referred to uh, already, the fact that the Lord disciplines, God disciplines his children. But coming down to uh, verse 11, it says, All discipline for the moment, uh, did I give you the chapter Hebrews 12, of course you realize where I am. Uh, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Those who have been trained by it, by that discipline. The word there is gymnazo, in which we get gymnasium. I don't know whether you work out with weights, I certainly don't. I (laughs) like to keep fit with gardening, but uh, it's a matter of training, of enduring hardship sometimes. And I think the Lord is training up his people for the times that lie ahead, so that we might be a witness in those times, so that when other people's hearts are failing them for fear, we will be looking up to him, knowing our redemption is drawing near we will have a completely different countenance to those within the world. What an opportunity to bear witness to Christ. That's one reason why I believe we'll go through the tribulation. He wants us there as a witness. I remember reading uh, something that David Pawson wrote. Uh, He would take very much this position of believing that we go through the uh, tribulation and he was speaking out in uh, somewhere in uh, Southeast Asia. And it so happened Corrie Ten Boom was there. And afterwards she shared with him, she said, you know, I'm so glad that you pointed out that we need to be ready for the tribulation and prepared to go through it. Because she said when the Cultural Revolution came in China, the church was shocked. They thought they would be caught up before any problem like that ever came. They would be rescued. They wouldn't go through any hardship. My friends, Paul said, through many tribulations we enter the kingdom of God. Whatever may be your view, I'd rather take a, be prepared for the worst uh, and find I'd be wrong. Uh, and it's much better than I thought. But I believe that we need to prepare the church for the days that lie ahead. And it's your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your faith in God the Father is with you. Your recognition that the Holy Spirit is there with you day by day. It's that faith in God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit that will enable us to go through those difficult times and to be that witness. My friends, we should not collapse like a pack of cards at the first gale that blows along. I believe God is training up his people at this present time. Well, it hasn't been easy going through this because I find myself uh, moving from one thing to another. I've tried to outline just those four points really. A living relationship, living righteously, abiding in the truth and overcoming the world. All of that I believe is walking in the truth. And what a privilege to be called of God, to be his ambassadors. What a privilege to be a royal priesthood. What a privilege to be called a special possession for for his own 
purposes to declare the mercies of God. But above everything, what a marvelous thing to be called into a living relationship with God our Father and with His Son. Our fellowship is precious. We need it. We need to encourage one another. But there's a, a fellowship we need to cultivate far more than we do. May God help every one of us. I know I haven't arrived. But like the Apostle Paul, I press toward the mark. And I rely on his spirit and his word. And the character of God to get me through. A faithful one in the midst of the storms. Hallelujah. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let's bathe in his love and rejoice in his fellowship. Hallelujah. Father, I've had a job separating my thoughts out a bit. All that John has written here and how it's all intermingled with one another. And Lord, I believe that's absolutely vital if we're really going to walk in the truth. So will you help us as your people, Lord? And may we be a people prepared and ready for those days that lie ahead. That your name may be glorified.